Hello AQA and OCR students, we know how important equations and formula are for multiple choice questions. This video will push you to the max with some of the hardest questions there have been really on equations and formula. Make sure imperatively that you've watched my formula, equations and conditions videos for micro and macro. So important. The assumption is you know all of that for this video, but let's dive right in looking first at a multiplier question. So a nifty little multiplier question here. There are two equations you might need for multiplier questions. Here they are. We get these from my key formula equations and conditions video. So to work out the multiplier, it's one over one minus the marginal propensity to consume. Don't forget the one minus at the bottom there. And then the change in actual income uh, is just whatever the initial injection was multiplied by the multiplier. So now this question is saying that there was a two billion pound rise in government spending. So that is the initial injection. Always good to underline and to annotate, write things down, keep your mind simple so that you're not going to make silly errors. So that two billion pound increase in government spending has led to a five billion pound increase in national income. So that's the final change in national income. The question is saying uh, all other things being equal, what's the value of the MPC? That's what we need to work out. Underline the key parts of the question, therefore. Right. So given all this information, let's work out the value of the MPC. So we know that the change in national income uh, was five billion pounds from an initial injection of two billion pounds. So to work out the value of the multiplier, just rearrange the equation to get X. I'm just calling X the value of the multiplier. So it's going to be five divided by two to get X which is 2.5. So that's the value of the multiplier. So go to the equation at the top, 2.5, which is the multiplier, is equal to one over one minus the MPC. Let's just call that X. One minus the MPC is X, right? Not the MPC itself, one minus. Rearrange to get X. So one over 2.5. You, you are allowed to use calculators. So use your calculator to work that out, and that is 0.4. So 1 minus the MPC is 0.4. So to get 0.4, the MPC must be 0.6, right? 1 minus 0.6 is then 0.4, and that takes you to B as the correct answer. Those equations are crucial. Easy peasy when you know the equations, but do you know how useful index numbers can be? Have a look at these next two questions to guide. This question will show you just how useful index numbers can be. Let's read the question first. So an economy is operating at its long run productive capacity at the start of 2020. So the economy is operating at YFE. Annotate, write down things that are going to help you. It has a trend rate of growth of 6% per year. That is its potential growth. Tr trend growth is potential growth. Its real GDP is increasing by 2% in 2021 and 10% in 2022. That's very important information. That is actual growth. The question is then asking, which one of the following accurately describes the position of the economy at the end of each year? So the question is all about output gaps. Let's go to some background, make sure we remember what an output gap is. So a negative output gap is when actual growth is less than potential growth, a positive output gap when actual growth is greater than potential growth. So in 2020, both were equal, right? Actual growth was at potential growth, uh, the economy was at YFE. Uh, we need to work out what actual growth was in 2021 and in 2022 compared to what potential growth was in 2021 and in 2022. We only have percentage changes, so index numbers are very, very useful now. So just call both actual and potential growth 100 in 2020. That's our kind of base year. We can always choose our base year. So always just whatever year you're starting from, just call it 100 and work from there with percentage changes. So let's start with potential growth. We're calling it 100 in 2020. So in 2021, 6% more from 100 is 106. What about in 2022? 6% more from 106 is what we need to work out, right? So it's 106 multiplied by 1.06. That's how we work out percentage increases. Uh, you're allowed to use a calculator, so work that out. That will give you 112.36. Do the same for actual growth. We're calling it 100 in 2020. In 2021, it's 2% more. So that's 102. And then in 2022, it's 10% more, but 10% more from the 2021 figure. So we need to multiply 102 by 1.1. If you do that with your calculator, you get 112.2. So there we have it. Potential growth and actual growth figures from here. We can then work out output gaps. We can see in 2021, actual growth was much less 
the potential growth, that's a negative output gap. But even in 2022, just actual growth is less than potential growth, a negative output gap. So the answer is A. God, index numbers are so helpful. And you'll see even for this question now. So now we have a table that contains rates of growth of nominal and real GDP, as well as the rate of inflation in a given year. The question is saying which one of the following combinations is the correct relationship, the correct relationship between the three variables. Okay, so the equation we need for this is the real GDP equation. Again, get that from my formula, equations and conditions video. We should all know this equation by now. Real GDP is nominal GDP divided by a price index multiplied by 100. So we need to use that equation and to see, you know, which combination is correct here. But we've got percentage changes. So that's where index can come in handy. Whatever the year was before, just call that the base year. Everything was 100 at that point. Work from there in this year and use the equation to guide you. So take um, A. We have nominal GDP growth of minus 2%. So nominal GDP from 100 the year prior minus 2% is going to make that 98 divide by the price index, the rate of inflation plus 2%. So call that 102 from 100 the year before times by 100. Uh, you are allowed to use a calculator, work that out, plonk it in, and you'll get a figure of around 96. So that's real GDP growth, therefore, of minus 4%. Uh, here it's saying 0%, clearly wrong. Do the same for B. So nominal GDP growth of 4%, that's going to be 104 from 100 the year before. Deflation of minus 1, so that's 99 at the bottom, times by 100. Um, again, use your calculator, you'll get uh, approximately 105. So that's real GDP growth of 5%, it's saying 3%, so that's wrong. The next one, 5% growth of nominal GDP is 105. Uh, inflation, 1% is 101. Times that by 100, you'll see in your calculator, it's around 104. So that's 4% real GDP growth. Here it says 5, so that's wrong. So it must be D, but just confirm that. So nominal GDP is shrunk by 5%, so that's 95, divided by deflation of minus 3. So divide by 97 times by 100, you get an answer which is pretty much 98, and that is a 2% shrinking of real GDP, which is exactly what D says, so D is correct. See how important index numbers are when you're working with percentage changes. That tip of how to use index numbers is unbelievably helpful for what are very tough multiple choice questions. I hope you enjoyed that and took lots in. Let's finish strong with how to do comparative advantage questions well. So we're told at the top what we can already see. We've got two countries that can make coffee or tea, uh, and with the same resources, this is the output they could make. We need to work out which one of the statements below is supported, which one is supported, which one is true. Okay, important that we highlight key parts of the question. We're looking for a true statement. This question is all about absolute and comparative advantage. Let's make sure our background is solid. So absolute advantage is just who can produce more with a given amount of resources. So here, both countries have the same resources. Country X can produce more coffee and tea. So they have the absolute advantage in both coffee and tea production. But to work out comparative advantage, we need to work out which country has got the lowest opportunity cost. So my advice, whenever you're working out comparative advantage from a table of data like this, write your own table on the side. So again, you have the same two countries, country X and country Y, but instead of coffee and tea, write down one coffee, specifically here, one ton of coffee and one tea. Again, one ton of tea. And then in the, in the cells, you're going to be working out the opportunity cost of each country producing one ton of coffee and one ton of tea. Once you've worked that out, whoever's got the lowest opportunity cost will have the comparative advantage. So let's do that for each country. Let's take coffee first. So for country X to make one ton of coffee, how much tea are they giving up? What's their opportunity cost? Well, to get one ton of coffee for country X, you've divided by 80,000, right? So you're working at a ratio. You do the same for the other side. So divide 100,000 by 80 and you get 1.25 tons of tea is what country X is giving up when they make one ton of coffee. Do the same for country Y, right? So for country Y to make one ton of coffee, well, you've divided by 50,000 to get one ton of coffee for country Y. Do the same to the other side. So 75,000 divided by 50, that's 1.5. So 1.5 tons of tea is the opportunity cost for country Y to make one ton of coffee. So what we can see here is that clearly country X has got the comparative advantage. They're giving up 
less tea to produce one tonne of coffee. Do the same for tea production. For country X to make one tonne of tea, we divide it by 100,000 to get one tonne of tea. Do the same to the other side, 80 divided by 100, 1,000 is 0.8 tonnes of coffee. That's being given up. And for country Y, to get one tonne of tea divided by 75,000, do the same to the other side. 50 divided by 75,000 is two thirds, 0.67 tonnes of coffee. Given up by country Y to produce one tonne of tea. Who's got the comparative advantage? Who's giving up the least coffee? It's country Y here. From this, you can then work out what the correct answer is. So what does A say? A says that country X has the comparative advantage in the production of both coffee and tea. No, they have it with coffee, not with tea. So A is wrong. What's B saying? B is saying that country X has the comparative advantage in the production of coffee. That's correct. And the absolute advantage in the production of tea. That's also correct. They can produce more tea with the same resources. So B is clearly correct, but confirm with C and D. C is saying the opportunity cost of producing both coffee and tea is higher in country X than in country Y. Well, it's higher for tea, that is correct, but it's not higher for coffee. So C is wrong for that reason. And D is saying the opportunity cost of producing tea in country X is lower than it is for country Y. No, it's higher. So D is wrong as well. So that table of data, crucial. So there you have it, guys. Some tough equation-based questions there. Hopefully now you're okay with those. You can smash similar questions if you see them in your paper three. But again, make sure you've watched my formula, conditions, and equations videos for micro and macro, as well as all the other multiple choice questions videos on the channel. We want to be super sharp to smash these gifts from the economics gods when they come up in your paper three. They're lovely questions. Let's do great together. Use the channel to guide. Thank you so much for watching this video. Can't wait to see you in future ones.